Seven years after the brand new Kings Island opened in Ohio, the park built and designed one of the best roller coasters in the world. Designed by two people who had never built a roller coaster before, taking guests on a one and a half mile journey into the wilderness. A roller coaster that reignited theme parks around the world to build bigger, faster, and longer. The Beast. The biggest, baddest, longest, fastest coaster in the world. The 1920s were known as the first golden age of roller coasters, with over 2,000 roller coasters popping up all throughout the US. Names such as Harry Traver, John Miller, and Ale Thompson were frequently linked to bigger and more exciting rides. That is, until the Great Depression hit, Wall Street crashed, and the Second World War came. Many of these once booming parks began to close, and coasters were scrapped to provide material. During the 50s, there was a revival in amusements with Disneyland's opening. Overnight, it captured the imagination of the world. The theme park concept had arrived and it would bring in a new era, as well as a new coaster war, steel versus wood. On one side was the new ideas designed exclusively in steel, delivering sensational high-speed rides pioneered by the likes of Ron Toomer, Carl Bacon, and Anton Schwarzkopf, among others. On the other side was wood, with those who wanted to reincarnate the incredible wooden coasters of the past. Among those pioneering the resurgence was John Allen. The roller coaster is very simple. Of course, we have uh, to thank Isaac Newton for most of it, although now with space age technology, they say that he wasn't always correct in his uh, formulas for gravity. However, until something better comes along, I still use his formulas. John Allen became president of Philadelphia Toboggan Company in 1954, after working for them since the 30s and was one of the pioneers who kept the roller coaster dream alive during the depression. When Cincinnati's Coney Island was sold to Taft Broadcasting in 1969, park management entered talks to move the park to higher ground after constant headaches with flooding. Before the park closed in September 1971, each inch was surveyed to either be moved or rebuilt at the brand new park, 25 miles north of Cincinnati, Ohio, Kings Island. While the newest crowd drawing theme park, Walt Disney World opened in 1971, it didn't feature any roller coasters at all. A year later, on April 29, 1972, the second golden age of the roller coaster began, the day John Allen's White Wonder, The Racer, opened. This is a double coaster in the sense that two trains are going to race each other. I'm going to leave that incline and come down side by side through these two tracks to see which one can get home first. Allen, who created more than 25 roller coasters, many of which had significant contributions to coaster technology, came out of semi-retirement to design and direct construction of the $7,000 twin roller coaster. He said the roller coaster would be its last, with 600,000 board feet of lumber, each track being 3,288 feet long, and the object, of course, as the name states, is to race. The roller coaster made a bigger impact than many other coasters, even more so than the coasters that were faster than it, mostly attributed to how photogenic it was. A combination of modern tech fused into a 30s racing coaster. The racer was hugely popular with media and shown on TV all around the world. By 1978, the park's major roller coaster had more than 17 million rides since the park opened. Allen didn't retire after the racer. In fact, he continued creating coasters with the Great American Scream Machine, Woodstock Express, and finally after Screaming Eagle at Six Flags Over Mid-America opened in 1976, he would finally retire. After the success of the racer, Kings Island was looking to build another roller coaster on a plot of land next to it. They decided they wanted to resurrect the old Shooting Star, a popular ride from Cincinnati's Coney Island. Charles Din, Kings Island's Director of Construction, Maintenance and Engineering at the time, had surveyed the original attraction before it had been torn down, recording each measurement of the ride. Kings Island officials, however, decided that rebuilding an old coaster was not the answer. While a new shooting star would be great for nostalgia, a newer, bigger coaster would be even more popular. Many options were considered when the southeast corner of the park was thrown into the mix. A 35-acre area was surveyed, and the idea formed that it could accommodate a very special coaster. 
The first plan was plotted out on paper as soon as the idea formed, and there was only one man they wanted to design it, John Allen. While intrigued by the project, this time he had finally retired, and didn't want to take on such a long-term task. He did, however, provide inspiration for the project, and jotted down formulas and wood dynamic calculations for Kings Island's engineers on the back of a menu in the park's international restaurant. His advice was that they could design and build it themselves. The very next day, in 1976, park surveyor and chief engineer Al Collins and his assistant Jeff Gramke looked at the formulas and realized they were not too different from what they had used for railroad curves and highways. With the huge amount of space, the possibilities were limitless on how big the ride could be. When I started working on the beast, I was a surveyor in the uh, construction and maintenance department. Uh, our primary function at that time was to do as-built mapping and planning for new projects in the park. When we started to do the, the beast, it kind of evolved into being the designers of the beast. Al Collins was the, the crew chief on the survey crew. Uh, we were both engineering technicians at the time for the company. And uh, we had the opportunity to learn the formulas from John Allen from Philadelphia Toboggan Company to learn how to design the coasters. The other benefit was that by keeping it low to the ground, it would minimize the materials needed to build the structures. In a time before computers were used to help create coasters, each calculation had to be made by hand, making very labor intensive work. Everything had to be calculated, recorded, and planned piece by piece. The area that the ride would go would also prove difficult to map due to the rough terrain, and measurements of more than six feet at a time were hard to check. Just as Alan had suggested, the park decided to build it themselves. It would take over two years to research and design the new roller coaster under the direction of Kings Island's director of construction, Charles Din. So what we've done here, we've taken all the good points from a lot of rides around the country and put them into the beast. While Charles would oversee the project, it would be Jeff Gramke and Al Collins who would actually design the new attraction. The design continued to grow and grow until they wanted to build the biggest roller coaster in the world. Jeff and Al had done all of the layout work for the park. They had never designed a coaster before, but they were up for the challenge. They began studying every major coaster in the country to take the best features, but make it bigger. Taft Broadcasting insisted on a record breaker. The biggest, baddest, longest, fastest coaster in the world. The Beast is running wild in Cincinnati. You'll find it at Kings Island. But the beast is only the beginning. You're just a short drive away from America's top-ranked seasonal theme park. So this summer, track down the beast and discover all the reasons why you should stop and share the good times at Kings Island. Plans were revealed in July 1978 for the brand new roller coaster. The ride, which had been a closely guarded secret for three years, would be planned as a $3.2 million whirlwind with an expected top speed of around 70 miles per hour. Announced as the longest roller coaster in the world with the fastest speeds and longest drops. Using the natural terrain and tunnels, the park was especially proud of the fact they had built, designed, and would construct it for themselves. Three of the four tunnels on the ride would be underground. A month before the plans were revealed in June 1978, construction had began, with the coaster's lift hill being topped out in November. By then, 60% of the track, including the ride's three tunnels, were complete. Designed by an outside engineer, the tunnels were chosen as it was easier to dig out trenches than it was to make the ride 20 feet taller. Some of the footers for the ride could even go as deep as 14 feet. With its track length of 7,400 feet, not only would the ride have the longest drop in the world at 141 feet, it would also feature the second longest at 131 feet. Built with a traditional wood frame using treated red bar lumber, stained to blend in with the area, it would take riders on a whirlwind through the woods. In fact, the ride would feature 37,500 pounds of nails, 650,000 board feet of redwood lumber, 82,480 bolts, 5,180 washers, and 2,432 square yards of poured concrete, enough to pave 3.5 miles of a two-lane highway. One of the most difficult areas to construct was the large helix towards the end of the ride. Over 4,300 hours of design work was needed, including creating a new computer safety system, along with 87,000 hours of construction work to make the ride a reality. Curtis D. Summers Incorporated is the world's premier designer of wooden roller coasters. 
the certificates of engineering licenses, give claim to the king of the wooden roller coasters. Kurt Summers presently holds engineering certificates in 41 states and in several countries in the world. He is the most highly acclaimed wooden roller coaster creator ever. Curtis Summers, who had previously provided structural repairs to Cincinnati's Coney Island Shooting Star Coaster, will be brought in to work on the Helix. He had also previously created many of the structures within the park, including the replica Eiffel Tower. He had worked alongside John Allen on the racer and a smaller children's coaster that opened with it. While he didn't want to be involved with the project, John Allen would still help when called upon. He designed several of the ride's components, including the tire-driven launch system that increased capacity to over 1,000 riders per hour. Before this, the long track length gave concern that the throughput may be too low. His former company, Philadelphia Toboggan Coasters, would also provide the trains and install the bus bar restraints. In early 1979, the ride had finally found its name, The Beast. It was chosen because when given updates on the progress, it was always referred to as a beast of a project. Public relations liked it, and it stuck. Kings Island dares you to come face to face with the beast. The beast. 7,400 feet of unrestrained terror. In a 70 mile per hour attack on your senses, the beast throws you screaming through three tunnels, takes you higher than any other coaster. Come face to face with the beast. The Beast, the biggest, baddest, longest, fastest coaster in the world. Early testing revealed issues in the design of the final Helix track element. It provided more side acceleration than the design intended, so the entire Helix was rebuilt with a wider diameter. This change made the park delay the enclosing of the Helix. The first tunnel exit was also needed to be rebanked to reduce stress, and was completed in one night. This was before computers could test the forces and test dummies were used. It was the ride engineers that would ride the ride and be the test dummies. After a one year construction and huge amounts of work, the $3.8 million beast opened in the Rivertown section of the park with a press day on April 13, 1979. We'd like you to meet Carl Eichelman, the original beast tamer. Arguably, Carl Eichelman knows about riding the beast better than just about anyone else on the planet. And if you are looking for a true beast purist, then Carl Eichelman is your man. It was uh, Friday, April the 13th of all days, no less, Friday April 13th, 1979, and it was the press media day for Kings Island's opening of the Beast. It rained. It was cold, it was windy, and it was fun. It was, it was an absolute, I mean, most of us there, I don't think anybody even paid any attention to what the weather was like. They could care less. We were out riding the Beast, first chance to ride this spectacular new ride. And I'll quite honestly, I rode it six times that day, and if they'd have left it running, probably I would have rode, ridden it the rest of the day, too. Opening day, the skies poured all day, making the beast even faster. The first official riders included Taft Broadcasting and Kings Island executives, as well as park staff. Operating with four trains, the four minute long experience known as the Beast began with a ride up the 110 foot lift hill over a small lake before the first 45 degree angle drop down 135 feet into the first underground tunnel. What follows is a ferocious trip through the woods before reaching the second lift hill. This time with an 18 degree 141 drop speeding into the 540 degree helix and back towards the station. In the first year, lines were regularly two hours to ride the beast, and the new roller coaster became the gold standard, the tallest, fastest, and longest wooden roller coaster in the world. One of the first with its own marketing campaign and worldwide media attention. The opening years did have a few issues. Two of the four trains bumped slowly when the computer system never recognized the train's presence, and it had to make one complete trip before it would show up. To counter this, the park added sensing strips to each car, so they showed up straight away. Reaching speeds of up to 65 miles per hour over the one and a half miles of track, the beast was tamed slightly less than two months after it opened with the addition of check brakes throughout the ride. The helix and turn out of the first tunnel were also rebanked from 25 degrees to 40 to permit the higher speeds. This was completed after the 1979 season closed. When the lower half of the helix was worked on, it was also enclosed inside a tunnel. The second and third tunnels of the ride were also combined into one long 370 foot tunnel. 
one train was later removed to operate on three maximum instead of four. Just the speed alone, going out in the woods very fast. And then the Helix at the end, which really does work. The Helix is by far the best ending to any coaster I've ever ridden. This isn't a typical roller coaster. And it's sure been out there a long time. The challenge has been there, and no one has topped it yet. Amazing, you know, to have a coaster that's maintained its fame for that long. Most coasters don't do that. It really is number one. The Beast would change roller coasters forever, inspiring bigger and scarier attractions. Since opening in 1979, the Beast has given over 54 million rides and remained in the top 10 Golden Ticket Awards top wooden roller coasters ever since, receiving the Ace Roller Coaster Landmark Award in 2004. After over 40 years, the ride is still flying through the forest at Kings Island. There are some who think the ride is not as good as it once was, has become outdated, or just isn't that good to start with. I took my first ride in 2018, and it instantly became one of my favorite rides in the world. An iconic attraction that in 1979 was truly groundbreaking. There is something that is hard to beat about a night ride through the dark woods at 65 miles per hour. While when you break down the layout on paper, it may not seem all that impressive. No airtime or quick directional changes. Some even call it boring. But for me, the Beast is a different kind of wooden roller coaster. One that offers something unique and a coaster that is hugely greater than what it should be. A ride that is more about the fear of the unknown. A beast of a ride that each time you ride it makes it feel like it has lost control. Designed by two people who had never fully built a roller coaster before. This is a wild one. And personally, I can't wait to ride it because I like them wild and I build them wild. And I like to see the people scream from the time they leave that top until they hit back on the brakes. John Allen passed away in 1979, the year the beast opened. Always the Joker, when asked how he managed so long in the roller coaster industry, he replied with smoking, late hours, wild women, and booze with a slight chuckle. While he did not design or work on the Beast directly, he certainly inspired it. Charlie Dim would go on to create his own company with Curtis Summers, known as the Ding Corporation. And we have quite a few stories from over the years of those rides to tell. As for Kings Island, there was another record-breaking coaster that would come in the year 2000. A sequel, you could say. It will be one of the, all, the only wooden roller coaster in the world with a full loop. Secrets concerning the Son of Beasts. I, mean, I hate to think it might have happened, but did Kings Island hide the truth about the roller coaster's safety? This is the Son of Beast. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Expedition Theme Park. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition. What do you think about the beast? Let me know in the comments below. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates on upcoming episodes. And a special thank you to our Patreons for supporting the channel. We will see you next time.